you'd open, please, to the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. Luke in your Bibles this morning. I'm excited about what we've been looking at the last few weeks, and we'll continue to look at it for the next few weeks. We've been uh, doing an overview of the gospels of Jesus Christ. The gospels in the Bible are the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each one of the Gospels has a slightly different point to it, a slightly different emphasis to it. We looked at Matthew, and the emphasis of Matthew is that Jesus Christ is the king or king of the Jews. And not only is the king of the Jews, he wants to be king in your life, and he is king of everyone. The Bible says he's the king of kings and lord of lords. And Matthew, as you go throughout the Gospel of Matthew, you will find over and over again things and ideas and concepts that support his point that Jesus Christ is king. We went through the book of Luke, an overview of Luke, and saw how, I'm sorry, through Mark, and how Mark emphasized that Jesus Christ is a servant. That seems to be a lost, a lost idea that we would serve someone else. That we would not put our own values first, but actually put the values of someone else in front of ours. And Jesus Christ did that when he came down to earth and humbled himself, the Bible says, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The disciples in the book of Mark asked Jesus about how to be greater. They argued with themselves in Jesus Christ, if you're going to be greatest, you have to be the greatest servant. Then we came to Luke, looked at Luke on the overview last week, kind of the first kind of passage of Luke, and and looked at the point of Luke. And the fact that Jesus is the Son of Man who has come for salvation. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And Jesus Christ came as God and as man. He was all God and all man at the exact same time. And somebody asked, how could that be? Because he's Jesus. We couldn't be that. We aren't that. But Jesus, all God, all man. And some amazing facts about Luke. Luke is the longest book in the New Testament, or the longest gospel in the New Testament. Matthew has more chapters, but Luke has more words. That's like some people I know. They have less topics, but more information about those topics. And a five-minute phone call turns into a four-hour phone call. Luke's chapters are longer, but about a half, about one half of all the material that we find in Luke is not found in Matthew, Mark, or John, or any other place. Luke brought some incredibly unique stories and parables and miracles to us from the Gospel of Luke. Luke was a physician, a Greek physician. In fact, there's some words in the original languages in Luke that are straight out of some medical documents. He uses the exact medical terminology, Luke was a physician. He'll describe things in medical terms at times. He'll give us all the details. And apparently he wasn't like a modern physician because they could actually read his writing. There are four specific parables in the Gospel of Luke that are not found in any other Gospel. And one is the prodigal, some of which we'll look at this morning. Another one is the, uh, the, the story, the account of the rich man and Lazarus. One is a parable of the the widow who is really persistent, and Jesus teaches us about prayer. And one that many are familiar with is a parable of the Good Samaritan, found only in the Gospel of Luke. But this morning, I want to direct our attention to Luke chapter 15. A familiar parable, but some powerful, life-changing truths found in the parable of the prodigal son. The parable, a story of a young man who walked away and then came back. If we were to write the parable today, we would use perhaps different details, but the storyline would remain the same. Because many of us have known those who have walked away and come back home. In fact, if we were to ask this morning for testimonies and life stories 
There are some and many in this room who would say, here's where I walked the path of the prodigal son. And here's where I got to see God's forgiveness and his mercy and his grace in my life. And as a testimony to everyone here and those online, my friends, God wants to offer mercy, compassion, and forgiveness this morning. It's not a concept for tomorrow or for next week or for next year. It's a concept for right now. So let's look in Luke chapter 15. And let's read what Jesus told us. And let's ask for his help this morning as we kind of unwrap this passage and learn some things this morning. Luke chapter 15, beginning verse number 1. I'm sorry, verse number 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that follow to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and despair, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come and thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might, 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 might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed from the fatted calf. And he said to him, Son, thou art ever with me. And all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make Mary be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on this time this morning. Lord, I pray for your help this morning. As we look at this passage of Scripture, Lord, it may be familiar for some and may be brand new for others. I pray that your spirit would illuminate it to our hearts. You promised that your word, the scripture, would not return empty, wasted, and void. That it would have an effect on lives. And Lord, Lord, I ask this morning that it would touch our hearts in a fresh and new way. Lord, I ask that you would, during this time, help us to be the soil that would receive your word and, and grasp it and respond to it. And Lord, may you be honored and glorified during this time. We love you. We'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. This parable is only found in the book of Luke. Not found in Matthew, not found in Mark, and not found in John. Yet to many, a familiar parable. Even those who maybe don't go to church regularly would understand or perhaps heard reference to the, the prodigal son. Even culture will, will say, this, oh, that, that young man is a prodigal, referring to someone who has perhaps left a certain path that will, those would consider to be the right path. It's not an unfamiliar concept, but maybe you didn't know it came from the Bible or even from the Gospel of Luke. There are so many powerful truths inside of this parable. In fact, 
Lord willing, the next three weeks, we'll look at this passage right here. We'll look this week at, at the depths of some things, and next week, Father's Day, look at the, the Father in the story. And the third Sunday, we'll look at what happens when someone doesn't want someone to do right. The brother. All truths that I believe God will help us with. This parable has been called the parable of the two brothers, the lost son, the loving father, the forgiving father. But this morning, I want us to look at the extremes of the parable. Hearing from the, the Scots this morning in, in the Sunday school hour, they're ministering, if you weren't here in Japan, as missionaries, and, and uh, we support them here at First Baptist Church. And the question was asked, what's the weather like in Japan? And they said that it just hit 100% humidity, and they're going to an area where they get snow sometimes as high as two buses, is what they said. Now, that's extreme to me. Does that not seem extreme to you? Now, there are those down south who think the Michigan weather is extreme. We don't deal with tsunamis, hurricanes, an occasional tornado. Occasional. I think you had uh, the, the Griffins, they had one go through Gaylord last year. That makes the news. Other parts of the country, a tornado is as common as sliced bread. We don't have hurricanes. And yet, and yet people think, boy, the weather in Michigan, boy, that's extreme. Now, it does change in an extreme manner. Cold, hot, hot, cold. But in this parable, we have some extremes. We're going to notice this morning that this parable will go from the bottom of the barrel to the top of the universe. Extremes. This is a parable of unmistakable sinfulness, wickedness, selfishness and depravity and in the parable there's a sudden shift and you're going to find unparalleled compassion and forgiveness and love and restoration there are lessons to be learned examples to be demonstrated and deep doctrines of god to embrace all from the parable of the prodigal son and sometimes when we know a story perhaps as well as some of you know this story it becomes far too common in our heart and far too familiar in our spirit. So this morning, I want to challenge us with the extremes of the parable of the prodigal son. I want to point out this morning, first of all, that in this parable, we're going to see and we see the unbelievable depths of man's sinful choices. You must understand that in life, in life, when we begin to make choices for ourselves, that when we when we begin to make choices that we that are sinful, that displease God, there is an unbelievable depth to man's sinful choices. We think we can control the environment. We believe that we can we can have a handle on what we're doing, and we'll do this little sinful activity, but we will never go this far. And this parable teaches us, reminds us, and challenges us in the depths of man's sinful choices. Look in verse 11, when the Bible says, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Now, this was not a proper request. As anyone knows, an inheritance comes after someone typically passes. Not typically before. And here this son asks a selfish request. Dad, you're not dead, but I want your money. Now, that is a common request. In the Howell house and probably the Treadway house, Mama, Dad, you're not dead, but we need some more money for camp, for teen activity, for soccer, for a bike, for food, for McDonald's, just because we're alive. But this young man was not just asking for an allowance, not just asking for teen activity, not just asking for lunch, for school lunch. This young man was saying, Dad, I want my half of what you've lived your life for, of everything that you've done, of all the accomplishments that you've had. Dad, I want half of it. Though it was an inappropriate request, he didn't think it'd end up where it ended up. I want you to notice this morning that 
that when we make a sinful choice, the sinful choices bring disappointment. They bring disappointment. I've wondered before what this dad felt like when his son asked him this question. We often, and we will next week, focus on the end of the, of the account, the story, when the dad is now waiting by the road and viewing and looking for a son to come home. But I wonder what the dad felt like when his son walks in and goes, Dad, I want half of what I see around here. I wonder if the dad had a moment of thought like maybe some of us would have as dads or moms. This is not the son that I tried to raise. This is not the path that, that I try to teach him on. That This is not the decisions that I tried to train him for. I spent 12 years here as principal of Bridgeport Baptist Academy. And I'm convinced of this truth that there are no parents, or very few at least, very, very, very few parents who are trying to ruin their kids. Now, as parents, we're not perfect. We, we make mistakes. I make mistakes as a dad all the time. I pray regularly, God, help me not to mess up my kids. But I tell you, I, I wonder the disappointment of this dad. I've seen it from other parents. When kids begin to make choices, I've seen it uh, from, in relationships, a husband or a wife, when they make sinful choices, I've seen it uh, from parents, I've seen it from friends, when a friend goes a different direction and, and starts to leave the right path. I, I promise you, it brings disappointment. I wonder what the dad's face looked like when his son asked him this question. Listen, growing up in my house, there are times I could tell when my dad was proud and happy and when my dad was disappointed. Can't you? We know what that looks like. We know the, the look that says, boy, that's my son, I'm proud of him. And the look that says, you know what, avoid dad, because what I did was really stupid. We know the look of grief on a dad's face. And I just wonder what this dad looked like when this son came to him in this selfish, sinful demand and said, father... Give me my portion. Just hand it over. I'm done here. I'm done living in your shadow. I'm done waiting for my portion. I want it right now. And my friends, when we begin to demand things in the wrong time, mark it down. Sinful choice. Their time in relationships. That couples will demand what is reserved for marriage and intimacy and demand it early. It brings disappointment and it's sin. It's sin. And sinful choices bring disappointment. A father had an expectation. He worked alongside his sons and one day passed the farm down to his boys. And the expectation was cut short because the son made an unrighteous demand and a sinful choice. Not only do sinful choices bring disappointment, but sinful choices bring damage. Look, please, continuing the story in verse number 12. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me, and he divided them as living. Verse 13, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all. I love the fact that the Bible's filled with hope and encouragement. I'm glad that, and we'll find out in the story, that God is the God of mercy. That his mercies are new every morning, as the Bible says, great is thy faithfulness. But I would be neglecting my duties if I didn't tell you the Bible's filled with the results of sinful choices. And I would be negligent as a pastor, as a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not to tell you that the Bible is explaining here to us that when we head down a path of sin, doing things that God has said not to do, making choices for ourselves and not for our Savior, clearly walking away from the truth that we will, we will bring damage. We'll bring damage to ourselves. We'll bring damage to others. No one is an island. 
We are deceived when we think everything I do is just to myself and I won't affect anyone else. When we make these choices, we affect all of those around us every single time. You think, well, no one will be affected by what I partake in this drink. My friends, you will affect others when you drink. Drunk driving its a pandemic. I'm not hurting anyone else. I'm not hurting anyone else when I use this substance. You damage yourself and others. No one will know what I look at in the privacy of my home, on my phone. My friends, you damage yourself and you damage those around you every single time. Sinful choices bring damage. And yet we have these little pet sins that we hold on to. For others, it's going to be bitterness, unforgiveness. And I'm sorry for the hurt in your life, but unforgiveness is sin, and it will damage yourself and those around you. Gossip is a sin, and it damages yourself and those around you. Anger is a sin. And it damages yourself, and it damages those around you. We often justify our own sin, do we not? Well, my sin's a real struggle. Yours is unforgivable. Come on now, are you with me or not? You know what I'm talking about. You have the flesh, the, your flesh, your human nature inside of you as well as I do. You know how you look at someone else, boy, you know, I can't believe they would do that. I just get angry. The Bible calls it sin. And sinful choices damage myself and damage others. This young man, the story, his sin damaged his family. It damaged his future. This was his inheritance. This is what he would hopefully one day support a family with. A wife and some kids and and pass on to, to, to his children and then hopefully affect his children's children, children's children, children, all of that. And he wasted it all. Every bit of it. Wasted. There are dads and moms whose hearts are hurting because of a child's damaging sinful choices. Their grandmas, grandpas, boys and girls, best friends, co workers, neighbors whose hearts are hurting because of sinful, selfish choices. And no doubt when this young man asked for his inheritance, he had no idea that he'd waste it all. I imagine he felt like he was on top of the world. He was rich. He was wealthy. He could do whatever he wanted to do. Didn't have to work another day in his life. Until he ran out. There's damage. I read a story about a man. A story about a man with a missing finger. The story I read said this man (laughs) lost his finger when a snake bit him. Now, I had had some friends in Saginaw that used to to handle um, reptiles. Some we knew, my my wife and I knew the family, and they had some large, large reptiles. I love snakes. I know some of you don't like snakes, and We've had some staff members who are afraid of snakes. And I remember one camp when uh, the, the, one of the youth pastors at the time was afraid of snakes. And so this, this young lady thought it would be hilarious to grab a snake and chase a youth pastor around. I also thought it was hilarious. They thought they'd affect me with a snake. I love snakes. I remember I did my first science fair project on snakes and I held a ball python. They don't bother me really in any way, shape, or form. Don't want them like in my house typically, but beyond that I'm okay with snakes. And this family in Saginaw, they had some large constrictors. I mean, like 13, 13, 14 footers constrictors in Saginaw at that time. I don't think they do anymore, so if you're with animal control, I don't know where they live now. No, nothing. But this particular man had a rattlesnake as a pet. And most of you know about a rattlesnake, that they, they typically do one thing. They shake their tail to warn you they're about to strike. And as a story I read, I, I, I did not verify if it was real or not. It was a story, but apparently... <laughs> Uh, it was a six-foot rattlesnake, and he kept, kept it in the cage. And apparently he decided to scare his wife with it one day. 
Just a story I read. I read the story, I'm like, there are so many things wrong with this, with this individual. All right, from a rattlesnake to deciding to scare your wife. Okay, I, I've never tried that thing. My wife's shaking her head. She's like, don't. I don't think it'd end well at the Howell house. My wife knows all the combination to the safes. It would not end well. But apparently this man let this rattlesnake go in the living room. His wife, of course, naturally ran out of the house. So he went to grab it, so he grabbed a stick and stuck the stick right behind the rattlesnake's head. The stick broke. Snake lunged and bit him right on his, on his finger. And uh, apparently the snake at that time had, still had venom, had not been milked for the venom. And though his life was saved, he lost his finger. My friends, this is what sin does for us. We think we're in control. We think we can use it to our advantage. That we can mess around with it a little bit. But my friends, every single time, sin brings damage. Not only does sin bring damage and disappointment, but sinful choices bring destruction. Not only was he damaged, the Bible says he spent all. And after he'd spent all, verse 14, there was a mighty famine in the land. He began to be in want. You see, he was living the high life. He had it all. He ran out, and now he's at the bottom of the barrel. He ends up in a pig pen feeding pigs and no one would give him food so he's stealing food from the pigs my friends this parable tells us about the depth of sinful choices I want you to understand something this morning that in our sinful choices we have no idea how far we will go how much we will owe and how devastating life will be. I hope this morning that as we were reminded of the, par- the, the parable of the prodigal son, that we'll be reminded with a good dose of healthy fear that sin will always cost more. It will always hurt more. And it will always ruin more. The pair of the prodigal son teaches us about the depth, the unbelievable depth of our sinful choices. And don't be deceived to think that you will beat the system because we always lose with sin every single time. Sin has a price. It's a deadly, costly business that no one can dabble in without being swept away. If the story were to end there, it'd be a sad ending, but unfortunately not an uncommon ending. If the story were to end there, many of us could put names of those that we know who have went down a path of sinful choices. Many of us could supply names, and unfortunately some who are even been close to us. And now they're in a place of disappointment, damage, and destruction and ruin. But I'm so glad. I'm so glad that the story does not end right there. If the story ended there, we'd say, you know what? That is a normal, unfortunately common human reaction because people will make sinful choices. But the story doesn't stop there. The parable doesn't stop there. It continues, and we see And we see not only the unbelievable depths of man's sinful choices, but the unbelievable heights of God's mercy. And we'll spend more time next Sunday on the compassion of the Father, but I want to give you this thought this morning. Please look in your Bibles in verse number 17. And when he came to himself... And my friends, there needs to become a point when we come to ourselves and realize that what we are doing is destructive and disappointing and damaging. He came to himself and he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and despair and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. And here it is. 
But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Don't miss this truth this morning. No matter how far you think you have gone, there is still a path back to God. No matter how far you think you've traveled, there is still a path back to God. Here in the story, here in the story, we don't know exactly how many hours and days and minutes this young man was gone, but I know that the entire time that this young man was wasting away and damaging himself and disappointing his father, that there was a father back home who was counting down the moments, counting down the seconds, waiting and longing for his son to just make an appearance on that path. And as soon as that father recognized his son, we don't know how far, but I imagine if he's a normal and a good, compassionate father, he had a binoculars. And not just those cheap dollar store binoculars. He had the biggest binoculars he could find, looking for just a glimpse of his son. And when he saw his son, he did not wait. He did not delay. He did not walk. He ran. You know why he ran? He didn't have a UTV. Because if he had a Polaris Ranger, he would have been driving that thing toward the sun, I promise you. Point being this, that that father ran back to his son as fast as he could. And no matter how far we think we've gone in the unbelievable depths of man's sinful choices, and you may be at the bottom of the barrel, and if you are, there is still a path back to God. You may be just starting off on sinful choices. My friends, there's still a path back to God. You don't have to go to the bottom. We see the height of the mercy of God. The Bible tells us this about, about God. No matter how many steps we've taken away from Jesus, it only takes one step to get back. James 4, verse 8 says this, Draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. And in your journey, you may be here in the depths of sin. You may be here in the depths of sin. But it's time to take that step back to God. I love Lamentations chapter 3. I shared it at camp, but I love one of my favorite portions of Scripture. Lamentations, speaking of, of judgment of God... Lamentations, the weeping. And this is what the Bible says in Lamentations, a book that is full of sorrow and sadness. It says this, This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man both should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. So if I encourage you in two ways this morning, my friend. Number one, if I encourage you that if you're in the middle of making sinful choices, be warned. Be warned that you have no idea how far you will go, how much you will owe, or how devastating life will be. And my friends, if you're in the middle of making sinful choices, turn back today. Turn back today. You don't have to have the damage that can continue on. You can find forgiveness. And, and no matter how far you think you've gone, there is still a path back to the Savior. He's waiting. And not only is he waiting... He's watching, and he's eager. He's eager for someone to come back to him. What I find interesting about this particular story, Jesus came to earth to save us, but in this story, the father was waiting and watching. We don't know if he knew where the son was at or not, but he was waiting for that son to take the step back to the father. That's all he's waiting for. He wasn't waiting for the son to pay everything back. He wasn't even waiting for his son's apology because he ran before he heard what the son had to say and then he cuts off his son. He knew by his approach back he was ready to come home. My friends, this morning God is ready for us to come home. Wherever you're at in that path, turn around. 
I love the fact that here at First Baptist Church, we get to see God work in a real way every single week. We get to see men and women and boys and girls touched by the power of Jesus Christ, finding victory in every way possible. And yet, in spite of all of that, there are those here this morning, and you look good, and you sing all the words, and you bring your Bible to church, and right here in your heart, you're making sinful choices. And you think no one else knows, and maybe no one else knows. And you think, I can handle this, and you're wrong. I won't damage anything, and you're wrong. Or you think, I've gone too far. My friends, there's always a path back to God.